Jameson and Harrison yesterday. You really let him oh, down. Oh, that doctor, too. Sure. Yeah. So did they, they haven't emailed me anything about Harrison this yet. So. Yeah, I'm cutting mine off. Well, your dream members that Skype in, did they just make them watch it and then they, you guys, like, got on FaceTime or something? Uh, yeah, they live stream. Live stream. Because uh, they're other people. So it's a celebration of the tonight, or is it? Let's not count our chickens before they hatch, my friend. I think it's pretty good. <laughs> Should be good. John, I'll be fine. I'm about to walk out there and uh, away from this. So you should be all good. And what are the light settings? Yeah, it's just right here. You just want the second one, or the last one's all off. Is that what you did yesterday? Hmm? Yeah, Lights yeah. off. Yeah, it's up to you. <laughs> so if I press it, it's not going to mess anything. It's just no, going to no, show no, me that. And it's the same thing on the walls up there. There's four buttons, same layout. Yeah, okay. Hmm. And if the screen goes black, there's a little button on the slide of answer that blacks the screen. Just hit it again and it'll come back on. Some people hit that and freak out. This? Uh, no, it's the bottom right one here. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. yeah, that would be awkward. Yeah, just hit it again and it'll come back on. <laughs> that doesn't look like four. It's not. Okay. Start with theory and then you work to your... Then you work to your... your <laughs> Your study site, Chuck. Come on. Thought you were a scientist. Making sure everything fits the way I expect it to over here. You don't need sound here. No. Okay. I don't want any sound. Will sound play? Can I mute that? Well, it should be muted, but there should be a little mute button on here. Just let's see. Because there, there is one. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. Because okay. okay. there, is, there is one button. I mean, there is one video that does have sound, but I don't want it to. <laughs> yeah, it should be one here, though. We need to. Yeah. Just funner swearing in the background. <laughs> Hopefully I'm enjoying the presentation. Mm -hmm. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. It looks like everything's working fine. If you have any yeah. problems, let me know, and I'll come back or just let the front office know, and then call me. And I left this here just in case you need it. It's back behind the screen. Oh, it's all good. I appreciate it. Yep. Um, I prefer not to use that, to be honest. Mm -hmm. yeah, that way I can. A lot of people just forget to repeat questions. Yeah. It's right. not the end of the world if people can hear the Well, if you repeat the question, it gives you a extra time to think. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Okay, um, yep, looks like you're all good. Good luck with everything. I'll be around if you do need anything. Yeah, thanks. Well, Appreciate well. it, man. Turn your paper around last night. Nothing? No, no. Um, <laughs> hey, Dr. Chair, how are you? We huh? should chat, though, about um, finishing my mology. We just got a final degree. And yeah. Well, yeah, that's what I figured after your interrogation. I had yeah. Lessons. And then I gonna go back and grab medicine because probably one of the oh yeah. yeah oh shoot I forgot to bring no. that I'm okay. sorry I'm sorry to hear about that I think there's gonna be a lot they okay was like, Jonas okay. Henderson and two deer I'm like wait a second wow <laughs> <laughs> they were probably expecting to get like a hind quarter yeah, I don't think they're honored I think they just had uh, they had you know he's struggling to eat yeah so yeah they, yeah uh, anything that can found something that worked for them <laughs> week, so again, or gets them excited so we're like okay we, don't, we can probably get we can work with this all right all right, so you uh, went to UVA. Any other important things happen in your life? That's, just make sure you hammer that home that, with this yeah. audience. Okay. <laughs> I'm his mom. Hi. Hello. Nice to see you. Yeah, this is my advisor. Yeah, this is Lynn. And what? Brother and Ashley. Travis, Travis, sorry. Hunter Travis. Hunter Travis. Hunter Travis. And Dad Chuck. Yeah, I'm Mike Harris. Hey, Mike, how are you? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Can you hear us? I'm just coming for you. I'm going to have a place you want to live. Yeah, I was going to. And I was like, I'm just not going to go to the bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> I like the home country. It's beautiful up there. Austin's kind of my hometown. It's a place I can do play with. Play with a little bit more time in the backyard. It's beautiful there. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. Was there any other way to have a childhood? No, I played with someone else. Either that or... or, or um, I used to go out and sit under the umbrella. See if we can. I mean, it's either that or... This is hot, by the way. Hmm? We're live streaming. <laughs> just so you're aware, Giselle. What? Is it? what? What's hot? The mic. I was just letting you guys know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> just, <laughs> I just wanted to, just so you're aware. Yeah, he said it should be going. Is this right, Marcelo? Yeah. 
Is this right? Mm hmm. It's supposed to be muted? Yeah, because that's the. No, the microphone's not muted, just the video's muted. Oh, okay. Oh, so that's. I think it's. Whatever. He said it was set up. No. I guess I'll trust the IT guy. Mm hmm. He said he's going to watch from his thing anyway. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I emailed them, um, Dr. Chandler and Dr. Connor, and said okay. I was going to send them the Zoom request afterwards. After, yeah. Do you want me to resend the link, or do you think they got it? For yeah, You can. Can't hurt. Hey, Michael, how's it going? Yeah, it's working. For you can. Can't hurt. Hey, Michael, how's it going? Oh, oh, oh. Man, it's so horrifying listening to yourself on audio. Anyway. Oh, okay. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm gonna go. Read something up here. You can do what? You mean like read something? Yeah. Now people, I think, I think, I think people prefer this. All right. Okay. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Bird feathers and uh, shells. I think it was a bird. I have a deer one, but I didn't like the color as much. Yeah. Turn the sleeper off. And this should be all she wrote. Go get something to coffee or something real quick. Yeah. Hmm? No, I got a whole water bottle. Thank you, though.
I've gotten a lot of correction from Marcelo on my previous introduction, so I'll try to incorporate those revisions today. Uh, first of all, this is so that the rest of Hunter's committee who are online and watching can also hear this introduction. So in addition to the committee on campus, who I'm sure you'll talk about momentarily, uh, Richard Chandler at the University of Georgia and Dr. Mike Connor at the Jones Ecological Research Center are also committee members, and we thank them for their service. Okay, so Hunter, was born and raised in Richmond, Virginia, and then he went to UVA. <laughs> Any UVA, UVA fans? Okay, Silence. so he got, <laughs> he got an environmental science degree from UVA, which is a pretty good school down the road, and realized shortly after a year or so of delineating wetlands that he wanted to be a wildlife biologist and this environmental consulting for the birds. And so he came here and started taking classes as a non-degree seeking student and also working uh, with Robert Alonzo on uh, Marcella's Predator Project up in Bath County. And that's where I first met uh, Hunter. He was taking my, my mammalogy class and was the top student in the class. And I said, we should talk about grad school. And everybody was asking him about grad school. Very uh, competitive candidate to recruit. But we got him here and he has done an excellent job. He received the Powell Fellowship as part of his funding here, and then was part of a large research team studying uh, South Florida deer-panther interactions. 
And this is a project that's had uh, six graduate students, two of which are here. Lydia Stifler is a University of Georgia grad student. Many of you may have seen her workshop yesterday or came to her workshop yesterday. She's traveled up to see her colleague present. Heather, as you all know, is also in this project. Um, so there have been six students. Uh, Hunter's the last one, I believe, at least last one funded. And, uh, <laughs> and he will be telling us a bit about some of his research here today. So with that, Hunter Ellsworth. Thank you. I'll be honest, I expected some flack about catching raccoons, but I didn't get it in the, in the introduction. <laughs> some of you may know that was one of my original uh, projects here. Um, but yeah, good morning. Thank you, Dr. Cherry. I appreciate the introduction. Um, again, I'm Hunter Ellsworth, and I'm here to talk about my master's thesis work today, um, discussing space use and survival of white-tailed deer in the Big Cypress Basin in southern Florida. So a persistent question in ecology concerns the forces that shape populations and distributions of species. Ecologists broadly classify these forces as top-down and bottom-up forces. And these forces can shape life history species through space, or excuse me, can shape the life history of species through space use, behavior, and survival. Organisms must interact with the environment, both biotic and abiotic, to gather resources to survive, grow, and reproduce. And the distribution of uh, nutrients and primary productivity determine the transfer of resources from the bottom, which can be influenced by disturbances both stochastic and uh, predictable. When studying large herbivores, top-down forces usually concern predators and their influence on prey mortality and life history. While there is perhaps no prevailing paradigm of exclusive top-down or bottom-up control, these concepts offer us a useful framework when evaluating ecological questions. So the Big Cypress Basin in southern Florida offers an excellent system in which to understand how competing bottom-up and top-down forces may shape herbivore ecology. This system contains a well-studied uh, large herbivore, the white-tailed deer, and both natural and anthropogenic disturbance regimes um, shape this highly fragmented landscape and influence the community as bottom-up forces, while a restored predator influences the community from the top. So to give some broader context to our work, our study site is outlined in the red box. Located in southwestern Florida, our work occurred in the Florida Panther National Wildlife Refuge and the northern units of the Big Cypress National Preserve. These two protected areas are part of over a million hectares of state and federal land in this part of the state. So the Big Cypress Basin is a dynamic system driven by pyrogenic and hydrological disturbance regimes, both strong bottom-up forces shaping the distribution and timing of resources across this landscape. These disturbance regimes are increasingly being shaped by anthropogenic influences. Monsoons seasonally inundate the system from May to October, creating distinct wet and dry seasons. These graphs illustrate the typical yearly variation in seasonal rainfall and surface water levels across this landscape. Both natural and prescribed burns occur frequently, and the system has a fire return interval of two to five years. Fire and hydrology determine the extent and structure of the uh, plant communities here and help maintain a highly fragmented landscape. Deer in the Big Cypress Basin have a diffuse breeding chronology, largely controlled by the hydrological seasons. Fawning occurs during a broad window that peaks in February, from February to March when water levels are the lowest and the height of the rutting activity occurs in August. In our system, historically, deer were not particularly abundant, especially in the more southern parts of their range. And deer, deer populations seem to fluctuate between dry and wet years. Starting in the late 19th century, there was a substantial push to drain the Everglades for agriculture and development. While this attempt to dry out the Everglades was an ecological disaster, generally it benefited deer as it increased available habitat. Further, the Florida panther, the historic apex predator in this system, faced persecution due to bounties and limited protections. After decades of heavy persecution in the southeast by the 1920s, panthers only existed in central and south Florida. And by the 19, early 1990s, only an estimated 20 to 30 individuals existed in the wild. However, in 1995, eight female cougars were introduced into this population to help with inbreeding and genetic uh, diversity. And since this recovery effort, the population has recovered to an estimated 120 to 230 individuals. The Florida panther is a large stalk and ambush predator that uses vegetative cover to stalk their prey. As such, panthers have greater potential to shape prey space use. 
um, and deer must cope with this predation risk across this landscape. Further, the greater Everglades ecosystem is witnessing considerable changes to its hydrological regime. As the comprehensive Everglades restoration plan seeks to restore the historical water flow across this landscape, which is going to change the timing and distribution of water. So this video shot over the Big Cypress portion of our study site uh, does an excellent job of illustrating the landscape that deer must navigate. As you can see, this is a highly fragmented landscape with many distinct habitat types ranging from wide open to densely forested. So this graph on the right shows deer harvest corrected for effort across all the units in Big Cypress over a 10 year period. And what this graph is demonstrating is that in general, the effort it takes to harvest a deer in Big Cypress has remained relatively steady or slightly increasing, suggesting the deer population is stable or slightly declining in parts of the preserve. Deer are the largest herbivore in Big Cypress and function as an important cultural resource and a critical food source for the endangered Florida panther. So deer in this system must contend with predation from an apex predator while navigating a highly fragmented system influenced by dynamic regular disturbances. For my thesis, I aim to better understand the influence of these top-down and bottom-up forces on space use, behavior, and survival of white-tailed deer in this dynamic disturbance-driven system with a restored apex predator. So my first objective was to understand the intrinsic and extrinsic factors influencing seasonal space use of deer in our system. And my second objective was to determine if temperament and risk-sensitive foraging in female deer affected deer survival by their primary predator, the Florida panther. So first, on space use. So variation in space use uh, is typically influenced by various uh, biological and eco ecological factors, and both home range size and phylopatry are important correlates of space use. An organism's home range is often defined as an area that is used over a specified period of time that meets the needs of an individual in order to survive, grow, and reproduce. Home range size links directly to an individual's life history needs and often the habitat quality within a landscape. Phylopatry or site fidelity is the tendency of an organism to occupy the same area for a sustained period of time. Phylopatry provides insight into how an organism's space use changes over its lifetime or from season to season, and it often indicates the stability of the environment. Organisms seek to minimize home ranges and maximize fidelity in order to occupy the smallest area that contains the resources they require, optimizing fitness by familiarity with resources and predation risk while minimizing energy expenditures. So many factors have been documented that affect home range size in deer. Due to differences in body size and reproductive demands, males and females experience different resource requirements across seasons as reproductive investment and predation risk varies. Additionally, females generally have greater predation risk due to smaller body size. And age can also play a part in space use as a proxy for life history needs. Extrinsic factors such as landscape composition or configuration or disturbance regimes have also been documented to influence space use. Landscape heterogeneity and fragmentation um, is thought to increase habitat edge and patch diversity, which may increase quality of resources and access to resources across the landscape. Landscape configuration may also play a part in predation risk by modifying prey movement or providing escape cover. For example, forest cover may provide thermal protection or serve as refugia from predators. Anthropogenic landscape modifications such as roads or development may alter space use as well by changing movement patterns or influencing predator-prey dynamics. Finally, disturbance regimes influence space use by impacting resource quality and resource distribution across the landscape. Phylopatry uh, to an established home range is often strong in many ungulate species, even in the face of disturbance, although fidelity may vary on seasonal scales. Phylopatry may increase survival or individual fitness as it can enhance an individual's knowledge about resources, conspecifics, and predation risk. So our study integrated the effects of landscape composition, configuration, disturbance regimes, and intrinsic biological factors on home range size across two seasonal scales, both hydrological and biological. And we predicted that home range size will vary across hydrological seasons with wet season home ranges larger than dry season home ranges as inundation, um, as inundation uh, uh, limits resource availability. 
We predicted that males will have larger home ranges than females, regardless of season, and that home range size will fluctuate with land cover composition, allowing us to evaluate the net quality of patch type of energy in terms of energetic gains or predation risk. Landscape features that facilitate movement will decrease home range size. However, some of these features, such as habitat edge or roads, may be associated with increased predation risk and therefore have the opposite effect. <clears throat> Seasonal surface water levels may limit access to resources and thereby de increase space use. And finally, as fire can reduce uh, concealment cover for ambush predators while simultaneously increasing the quality of forage, we expect short-term increase in space use in response to recent fires and decrease in space use as historical fire return interval decreases. We also assessed phyllopatry between corresponding and consecutive seasons in response to sex and season. So corresponding seasons are seasons, excuse me, are the same season across successive years, such as wet season 2015 to wet season 2016. And consecutive seasons are seasons that progress chronologically, such as wet season 2015 to dry season 2016. We tested the hypothesis that phyllopatry would vary by sex and season and predicted that uh, males would have weaker phyllopatry than females, especially during the mating season. And females would show the strongest fidelity during fawning and fawn rearing seasons in the face of an altered predator community and changing hydrological regimes. A revised understanding of the determinants of space use of deer in the system is critical. So between December 2014 and March 2017, we captured, marked, and fitted deer with GPS telemetry collars across our study site using three methods of capture, aerial net gunning, rocket netting, and darting. Collars were programmed to record points every six hours on a rotating, or six points per day on a rotating basis, and in total, 263 deer were captured and collared for the study. To estimate home range size and fidelity, we first needed to estimate seasonal utilization distributions, which we did across both hydrological and biological seasons using dynamic Browning Bridge movement models. Phyllopatchy was measured by calculating the probability of home range overlap, or PHR, between both corresponding and consecutive seasons. PHR is an intuitive measure that provides a probabilistic volumetric measure of overlap that yields the similarity of intensity of use between two utilization distributions. We defined hydrological seasons as wet season from May to October and dry season from November to April, and biological seasons as fawning from January to March, fawn rearing from April to June, rut from July to September, and post-rut from October to December. For females, energetic demands increase throughout gestation and peak during lactation, defined as the post-rut through fawn rearing, and males accumulate energy stores during the pre-rut or fawn rearing phase to increase reproductive success and may increase movement rates during the rut to expand access to mating opportunities. So to determine the effects of all of these intrinsic and extrinsic factors on space use, we first compiled a set of a priori covariates that might influence space use in our system based on the literature and previous research. So broadly, these included landscape composition and configuration, disturbance regimes, and intrinsic biological factors, all of which were calculated at the home range scale. So I'll briefly run through the development of some of these covariates. So this map demonstrates the predominant land cover types within our study site, and we use these land cover types to develop our landscape configuration and composition covariates, which included Euclidean distance to each of the six dominant patch types, forested edge density, and Simpson's diversity index. So those six dominant vegetative communities are pine flatwoods, cypress forests, hardwood hammocks, shrublands, prairies, and marshes. While other plant communities also burn, prairie and pine flatwoods are fire maintained and burn most frequently. While cypress forests, prairies, and marshes can be inundated seasonally or year round. This landscape is also shaped by anthropogenic forces, including roads and management decisions. All unpaved roads and off-road vehicle trails were digitized within the study area, and road density was determined for each seasonal home range. Due to management and recreational differences between the two sites, home ranges were either assigned as being in Florida Panther or Big Cypress. To examine the effects of seasonal hydrology on home range size, we created a surface water index, 
We use surface water data from five wells across our study site, along with land cover types associated with inundation to create a spatially explicit surface water index for each day of our study, <coughs> which represents the temporal trends in surface water inundation. It's important to note that this surface water index is a unitless index, with higher numbers representing higher levels of water and lower numbers rep representing lower surface waters and drier conditions. We calculated the mean surface water index for each seasonal home range to get a comparable index of surface water across seasons and home ranges. So this map at the bottom demonstrates surface water levels for just one day of our study site, and it shows the uh, a spatial variation we can get in surface waters across our site. Mean fire return interval and percent of home range recently burned were also calculated for each seasonal UD, representing both the long-term fire history um, and short-term structural and vegetative regrowth effects following a fire. Using almost 30 years of fire data acquired across our site, we created these layers for each season investigated, and mean fire return interval was, was characterized as mean time between burns since 1990. Recent fires were defined as fires occurring within two years of the last month of the season. And finally, sex was also assigned to each seasonal home range. So we developed a series of competing, <coughs> excuse me, of competing linear mixed effects models to test the effects of the predictors on home range size for each hydrological and biological season. As some deer were sampled more than once, individual deer were treated as random effects. All possible additive subsets of these variables were included in each hydrological and biological season model set and compared using AIC. As our interest lay primarily in understanding the factors influencing home range size, we drew inference using the top model. As I move forward with the results, I will only be discussing the top model for each season. We used linear mixed effects models to test the effects of sex, season, and the interaction on phylopatry. Due to lower sample sizes, we are unable to test the influences of extrinsic factors on the, co um, on the variation in phylopatry. So a total of 377 hydrological home ranges were estimated for 152 deer, and a total of 872 biological seasonal home ranges were estimated for 188 deer. <clears throat> As you can see, home range size varied across hydrological and biological season for males and the largest seasonal home ranges occurred during the wet season of the rut, while conversely, home ranges remain relatively stable for females. The top model for the dry season included the effects of sex, cypress forest, and pine flatwoods. Males had larger home ranges than females, and distance to both patch types increased, home range size increased. Oh, excuse me. Sorry about that. Top model for wet season included the effects of sex, study site location, pine flatwoods, prairie, forested edge density, Simpson's diversity index, and mean fire return interval. Males had larger home ranges than females, and home ranges were smaller in Florida panther compared to big cypress. For our landscape composition, covariates, as distance to prairie and pine flatwoods increased, home range size increased. For our landscape configuration covariates, as forested edge density increased, home range size decreased, and the Simpsons diversity index increased, home range increased. For our disturbance covariate, as time between fire increased, home range size decreased. The top model for the fawning season included the effects of sex and cypress forest. Males had larger home ranges than females, and as distance to cypress forest increased, home range size increased. The top model for the rearing season only included the effect of sex with males larger than females. The top model for the rut included the effect of sex, study site, and mean fire return interval. Males again had larger uh, home ranges than females, and home ranges were smaller in Florida panther. As time between fires increased, home range size decreased. And finally, the top model for post-rut included only the effect of sex, again with males having larger home ranges than females. The hydrological phylopatry models indicated a significant effect of sex and season um, interaction during both the corresponding and consecutive hydrological seasons, with male phylopatry values weaker than females across all season combinations. The biological fidelity models indicated a significant sex effect for corresponding biological seasons and significant sex and season effect for consecutive biological seasons.
It's worth noting that the larger confidence intervals for males are due to the fact that they are lower sample sizes due to higher mortality and lower capture rates. Our results demonstrate that white-tailed deer home range size in the Big Cypress Basin is primarily driven by sex and landscape composition and configuration. Males consistently had larger home ranges than females across all seasons, and sex as a principal driver of space use was present in all models. In sexually dimorphic ungulates, increased space use by males is predicted due to greater body size and energetic requirements. Further, males may increase, increase space use during mating seasons in order to learn about the distribution and breeding status of females. Our results support this hypothesis as males are predicted to have larger home ranges across all seasons, and the greatest variation in home range size occurred during the rut and wet season. So two forested patch types were important correlates to space use during the wet season, um, excuse me, during several seasons. Home range size decreased as distance to pine flatwoods decreased in both the dry and wet seasons, while home range size decreased as distance to cypress decreased during the fawning and dry season which overlap. Pine flatwoods and cypress forests represent two of the three forested patch types that we defined in this system. Pine flatwoods are a pyrrhic community and occur at higher elevations, while cypress forests are hydrologically defined and occur at lower elevations. Pine flatwoods are frequently burned, fire-maintained community, and as such probably provide improved forage opportunities across both hydrological seasons while cypress forests provide areas with moist soils and succulent new growth during the dry season and fawning seasons, they're likely less accessible during the wet season when water levels are deepest. During the wet season, home range size decreased as distance to prairie decreased. And with a one to two year fire cycle, this patch type is frequently burned community um, um, defined by its high quality forage that's commonly found in deer diet. At the beginning of the dry season, nutritional value of many of the preferred plant species in this patch type decrease and reach a seasonal low, and therefore prairie may not influence space use outside the wet season. Of the metrics of landscape, comp or excuse me, of the metrics of landscape configuration, edge density and Simpson's diversity index had a significant effect on space use during the wet season. Surprisingly, as Simpson's diversity index increased, space use increased as well. It's important to note that as Simpson's diversity index increases, not only richness but evenness of patch types increase. Our response may suggest the presence of a limited number of important patch types across an evenly patchy landscape where some patches are seasonally inaccessible due to inundation. Space use must increase accordingly to include um, a more even distribution of patch types that do not provide adequate seasonal resources for deer. Home range size decreased with decreasing edge density, supporting the premise that deer space use is often correlated with the increased habitat quality associated with habitat edge. However, in our system, forested edge is also linked to panther predation, or risk of panther predation. Oh, excuse me. Home range size may be influenced by edge density during the wet season if females begin to show diminished investments in uh, reproduction due to increasing independence of offspring, demonstrating increased tolerance for riskier habitat. As males enter during the rut during the wet season, uh, their testosterone levels rise, and they may also show increased tolerance for risk. For both sexes, home range sizes were smaller in the Florida panther than in Big Cypress during the wet season and rut. The smaller home ranges in Florida panther suggest better habitat quality and may arise from differences in habitat management. Florida panther undergoes significant management via prescribed burning and invasive species removal, increasing the overall quality and quantity of forage across the refuge. Due to a slight east-west um, increase in elevation, deer on Florida panther were also captured at slightly higher elevations, potentially leading to lower rates of inundation in smaller home ranges. Only one fire disturbance covariate predicted space use during two of the six seasons. Home range size decreased as mean fire return interval increased during the wet season and rut. Fire can both reduce concealment cover and increase forage um, quality through new growth and a previous study in Big Cypress uh, um, showed that deer respond to recent fire by increasing their space use post-fire to incorporate burned areas within their home range. However, this effect was diminished by the third month post-fire. As a representation of long-term fire history, the effect of fire return interval on space use was counter to our predictions. We assumed that shorter fire return intervals would increase habitat quality, increasing foraging, and decreasing predator concealment cover.
However, in a landscape containing many open habitat types, perhaps deer are attracted to areas with higher fire return intervals, as these areas may provide needed hiding cover and thermal refugia during the hottest times of the year, the wet season, and the rut, when activity levels are also the highest. Perhaps in the Big Cypress Basin, the effects of fire on the landscape are most beneficial immediately following the fire, and then subsequently beneficial on longer time scales, uh, with improved concealment cover or fruit production. Surprisingly, we found no, no direct effect of season, surface water index on the scales that we examined. In the Big Cypress Basin, surface water has been demonstrated to influence space use um, by restricting deer movement and decreasing access to preferred resources. However, these negative effects were mainly witnessed after a threshold water level was exceeded. This may indicate that deer are well adapted to the seasonal hydrological disturbance regime and only alter space use in the face of extreme events such as hurricanes. Further, patch type as a strong proxy for seasonal inundation and fire history may be a more important element in determining space use, as demonstrated by cypress forest decreasing home range size during the dry season but having no effect during the wet season. An attraction to pine flatwoods, prairie, and smaller home ranges in the more frequently burned Florida Panther National Wildlife Refuge. The effects of fire and seasonal inundation may best be seen through seasonal use of patch type. Across both hydrological and biological seasons, differences in corresponding and consecutive seasonal phylopatry were largely due to sex. Females likely have higher phylopatry than males as a result of higher inherent predation risk and increased cost of reproduction. Females must balance offspring safety with high energetic demands of reproduction. Other studies have demonstrated that phylopatry during fawning and fawn rearing is high in deer species and can confer knowledge about the location of resources and predation risk. This is further supported by female phylopatry being strongest during the transition between fawning and rearing seasons. So ecological theory um, hypothesizes that in unpredictable environments, organisms should continue to use a site regardless of the quality as long as habitat quality does not vary among available territories. So in an environment where surface water levels can vary from year to year and both wild and prescribed fires uh, occur unpredictably, higher phylopatry may be advantageous, advantageous to females in this seasonally unpredictable environment. This might also explain why surface water or recent fires showed no effect on seasonal home range size, in spite of evidence of short-term shifts in space use responding to both fire and flooding. Males maximize their reproductive success by increasing their home range size and movement rates during the rut, again to learn about the distribution and breeding status of females, as demonstrated by their lower fidelity during the rut. So in a dynamic disturbance-driven ecosystem with a restored apex predator, it appears that sex and landscape composition and configuration are the primary drivers of space use. However, stable space use between and across seasons may remain high for females due to the unpredictability of the environment and increased knowledge about predation risk. Deer in the system may be well adapted to regional disturbance regimes and only alter space use in the face of extreme events or for short time scales to exploit resources or patch types may represent proxies for uh, water levels or burn history. In continuously unpredictable environments, paradoxically, disturbance may not actually drive space use as a result of resources and risk fluctuating. Instead, disturbance creates a dynamic and unpredictable landscape, which may enhance phylopatry. Our ability to assess the effects of many biological landscape and disturbance factors on home range size let us compare the relative importance of these factors to better understanding the underlying determinants of space use of deer in the system. With growing access to higher resolution data sets, including biologging and landscape scale data on composition, configuration, and long and short term disturbance regimes, this increasingly allows biologists the ability to measure how various extrinsic and intrinsic factors simultaneously affect home range size across populations. So, on to our second objective or second chapter. We wanted to determine if temperament and risk-sensitive foraging affects deer survival by their primary predator. So predator-prey interactions are integral to our understanding of prey population dynamics. Predators uh, affect prey directly through consumption and indirectly by altering prey behavior and physiology. Predation risk effects are the costly anti-predator responses induced by the presence of a predator. And the trade-off between safety and resources 
are fundamental to the study of risk effects. And this trade-off may result in behavioral changes. Vigilance, for example, is a well-established well -established risk effect relating directly to a trade-off between time spent vigilant, or safety, and time acquiring resources, or feeding rates. Altered states of behavior induced by fear of predation can influence individual prey fitness. The ecology of fear incorporates these indirect behavioral effects into population models of predator-prey dynamics, establishing a continuum between two types of systems. In-driven systems driven by consumption through direct predation and systems driven by fear or behavioral effects. In fear-driven or mu-driven systems, risk effects impact prey foraging behavior through increased time spent vigilant and may buffer prey population dynamics as catchability fluctuates. Increasing predator densities and the associated increased predation risk should produce more vigilant and less catchable prey while decreasing predator success and increasing prey survival. Oscillating proportions of anti-predator behavior in prey populations may be a mechanism that enhances density-dependent responses and increases prey population resiliency in behaviorally driven systems. Foraging theory dictates that in the absence of any perceptible presence evidence of a predator, prey must select a level of fear that determines their baseline level of vigilant behavior. However, this baseline level of apprehension may vary consistently between individuals due to differences other than sex, age, or size. Temperament, or personality, is the consistent inter-individual variation in a given behavior across contexts and over time. Such behavioral traits have been connected to differences in risk tolerance. Temperament within populations has been linked to differences in survival and reproduction. And predation risk may be variable between individuals due to differences in temperament. This may affect how prey populations respond to both the direct and indirect effects of predation. There's growing evidence for temperaments and ungulate species across many axes of personality, including foraging behavior, uh, habitat use, movement, and dispersal. There is potential for temperaments to affect vital rates and even scale to population level processes. Across their range, anti-predator behavior has been extensively studied in white-tailed deer. However, little is known about how temperament affects individual survival in this species. After the successful restoration of the Florida panther, this apex predator functions as the dominant predator of white-tailed deer in this system. Ambush predators such as panthers are expected to amplify risk effects in prey due to strong associations with habitat cues. Increasing their prey's ability to perceive and respond to the risk of predation and thereby providing an ideal candidate for studying fear-driven interactions. Increasingly, many ecologists are further calling for the restoration of predators across systems that have witnessed their loss, and these restoration projects may also lead to the restoration of mu-driven processes. And behaviorally sophisticated predator-prey systems understanding the factors that influence population persistence is critical. So we hypothesize that temperament and risk-sensitive foraging in female deer due to inter-individual variability in vigilance will lead to variation and catchability, such that risk-tolerant females that spend relatively uh, more time feeding and less time vigilant face an increased risk of predation. We will be looking exclusively at female white-tailed deer survival, as in a large mammal populations, this is the most important population parameter. So to accomplish this goal, we exploited two sources of concurrently collected data. And just as a reminder, we collected GPS data across this population, um, and we captured 150, 153, excuse me. <laughs> 150, that, that, was, that was a good flub. 153 female white-tailed deer. Um, and uh, uh, each deer received a numbered ear tag as well as a collar with uniquely identifying characteristics. Collars were programmed to send a mortality signal, and predations were categorized using multiple criteria. So our study also simultaneously deployed 180 trail cameras across three grids for three years. For each grid, 40 cameras were located on trail and 20 were located off trail, for a total of 60 per grid. And cameras were checked every 30 days, and species were identified, or excuse me, and animals were identified to species. With these two sources of data, the vigilance behavioral data was captured across our camera grids, while the known fate survival data was collected via the GPS collared deer. So to show this intersection of data visually, first note the distribution of all 153 female deer across the study site in the top of this graphic. The camera grids are shown, the three camera grids are shown outlined in black, and the distribution 
uh, of the collared deer is represented by their 95% utilization distributions by the dotted polygons. We zoom into each of these three grids along the bottom of this graphic, indicated by the corresponding letters, we can see the 95% utilization distributions of females within each grid that were caught on camera. Now, these UDs are indicated by the dark blue polygons and cameras are indicated by the plus signs. So this combination of marked and collared deer across our camera arrays gave us the unique opportunity to link temperament and risk-sensitive foraging to individual survival of white-tailed deer, which is typically a species we cannot uniquely identify, females. So the first step in this process was identifying the deer, which we used doing numbered ear tags, numbered, uh, or excuse me, collar tags, and other unique collar characteristics, such as colored zip ties or shapes that we had affixed to the collars. Next, the foraging behavioral state was assigned to each image of a marked deer. Using the point of, a snout, using the point of the snout as a reference indicated by the red circle, um, we categorized head posture as head up or head down relative to the ankle joint, shown by the dashed red line. Each image was also assigned information about group size, deal scale, trail status, and season. Images of marked deer were subset by five minute intervals to separate short term foraging bouts, and only individuals with 20 or more images were used in further analysis. Excuse me, 10 or more images, I spoke there. Here we can see the final independent capture history for each collared female deer. The horizontal line represents the deer's capture history, with the green circle indicating the capture date and the blue triangle indicating the event date, either um, censored or predation. <clears throat> the plus signs along the black line um, uh, indicate uh, in image capture history. So our final data set had approximately 1,700 images of vigilant behavior. So there's a lot going on in this figure. I'll take a second to unpack it, but importantly, it illustrates the process of linking temperament and risk-sensitive foraging to known fate survival in a marked population, specifically using deer 269 as an example. So as you can see in the upper right-hand corner, this deer was captured in January 2015 and collared for approximately three and a half months. <clears throat> During that time, she had a total of 20 independent detections on camera, where foraging behavior via head posture was categorized as either head up or head down. The map at the center of this figure displays this process spatially with deer 269's home range depicted by the dotted polygon. Camera locations across her home range are indicated by the crosses, and the scale bubbles at each camera location indica indicate independent captures on camera. She died in late April by predation by panther, as you can see in the right hand most panel, and predation by panther was determined by a mortality investigation and confirmed by a camera placed at the cache site. So to identify the baseline level of vigilance for each individual deer, we used a generalized linear mixed effects model, or GLMM, assuming a binomial error distribution and logit link function to model the foraging state of marked deer, as this model is a well-established method to study vigilant behavior in deer. We used group size, deal cycle, day or night, trail status, on trail or off trail, a continuous time trend, season, wet or dry, and the interaction of deal cycle and season, and deal cycle and trail status as fixed effects, and camera location and individual deer identity as random effects. It has been previously demonstrated that these factors affect deer foraging behavior. So deal cycle, season, and the interaction of the two were predictors in our model, and as our interest lay principally in the conditional modes of this model, we wanted to account for any potential influence of these fixed effects on vigilance, so we included these fixed effects in our final vigilant model. Forging theory dictates that in the absence of any tangible evidence of a predator, prey must select a baseline level of a fear that establishes their level of vigilant behavior. The random effects intercepts for each individual deer represent the probability that an individual deer's head will be up given all other covariates set to the reference class, thus representing the inter-individual variation in baseline foraging behavior in this marked population. This is a representative measure of how individuals differ from the population. So from that top model, we extracted the random effects for each deer to create an index of foraging risk, and this index was scaled and centered to help with the interpretation of results. So deer that spend relatively more time foraging and less time vigilant were categorized as more risk tolerant and deer that spent relatively less time foraging and more time vigilant were categorized as risk adverse. The repeatability of vigilance behavior, or intraclass correlation coefficient, was measured as the ratio of between individual variance to total variance of the model. 
and the repeatability of vigilance of foraging behavior in, in this model was significantly low. So finally, we linked the index of foraging behavior as a covariate in a Cox proportional hazards model. Only female deer that survived the study were censored and had known fate survival uh, were used in our analysis. And our final data set included 37 female deer with known fate survival. All events were due to panther predation, 11 in total, allowing us to test the effect of risk-sensitive foraging on predation by panthers. So the foraging risk index was a significant predictor of risk, and for every standard deviation of foraging risk, hazard rate increased by 96%. And that rug along the x-axis represents the foraging risk index for all the female deer that were included in this analysis. Our results demonstrate that female white-tailed deer that trade off safety for resource acquisition um, due to temperament and foraging behavior have increased hazard rates, supporting our hypothesis. In a carnivore ungulate system, temperament and risk-sensitive foraging influences prey catchability in the presence of a large stalk and ambush predator. Individuals foraging under the risk of predation must trade off between safety and resource acquisition, and individuals that do not properly calibrate their perception of danger risk increased capture rates. In the Big Cypress Basin, female deer with increased risk tolerance <clears throat> sacrifice safety and have decreased survival, supporting a fundamental tenet of foraging ecology. When these differences in vigilant are a result of temperament that is consistent and repeatable, they lead to differences they, they, they lead to persistent differences in predation risk between individuals. These individual differences have important consequences for population dynamics as the heterogeneity of risk effects can affect how prey populations respond to predation. Oh, sorry, I did. Yeah. While they may seem maladaptive to survival for individuals that do not properly calibrate their perception of risk when foraging, the maintenance of these temperaments may be due to two possible sources. We measured one aspect of fitness or survival, but temperaments may lead to differences in life history trade-offs. For example, female deer that spend more time foraging have lower survival. However, these females may have increased offspring survival due to improved body condition from higher resource intake rates. Within this temperament, fitness may equivalent in individuals in a way we did not measure, such as lifetime reproductive success. Behaviors can often appear suboptimal when studied in isolation. And variation due to predation pressure may be another mechanism uh, that maintains risk-sensitive foraging in this population, lending support to the ecology of fear. Variation in catchability stemming from the demography of temperament may preserve this foraging temperament in prey population as predator densities oscillate. As panther densities increase and risk-tolerant individuals face higher mortality, proportions of risk-adverse foraging phenotypes increase in the population and prey catchability decreases overall, buffering the population against increasing predation when panther densities are high. As panther densities decrease and risk-tolerant individuals face lower mortality, proportions of risk-tolerant phenotypes increase in the po population and prey catchability increases. Indices of panther densities suggest the densities are currently high, and yet yearly survival rates of female deer within our study site have increased during this time possibly signifying a behavioral process functioning to buffer against predation. Further, while our marked population of uh, deer only contained 37 individuals, our foraging risk index showed a slight right skew, possibly indicating higher proportions of risk-adverse individuals as would, be, as would be predicted in a mu-driven system when predator densities are high. In mu-driven systems, fear enhances density-dependent responses between predators and prey. This variability in survival of deer in Big Cypress Basin due to temperaments and risk-related foraging behavior may speak to the restoration of the mu-driven processes accompanying the recovery of a large carnivore. So in conclusion, we supported a fundamental idea of foraging theory that when individuals forage under the risk of predation, those that trade safety for resources face higher predation risk. An increased research into the risk of carnivore ungulate systems needs to recognize how temperament may, may affect uh, risk effects and potentially scale to population vital rates um, and even affect long-term population viability. Recent calls to the restoration of large carnivores and systems that have witnessed their loss uh, may also lead to the restoration of mu-driven processes within those systems. 
Large carnivore restoration provides us with a unique opportunity to learn about fundamental ecological questions, um, as well as study the inevitably complex management challenges that come from restoration. Variation in risk-sensitive foraging is likely one of many strategies prey might, that prey populations might employ to buffer against cycles of predation. And fully understanding these processes is critical to population persistence of both predators and prey. <clears throat> And with that, I'd like to acknowledge everyone who has made this, this project possible, including all of our partners, especially the support from my advisor, Dr. Cherry, my committee, Dr. Richard Chandler, Dr. Mike Connor, and Dr. Ford, and all of my South Florida collaborators, including Dr. Richard Chandler, uh, Mike Cherry again, Connor, Daniel Crawford, Elena Garrison, Brian Kelly, Carl Miller, David Schindel, Lydia Schiffler, who is here, and Florent, and my family, who are here today, as well as all of my lab mates and many people within this building who have been supportive throughout this process. The South Florida Deer Project was truly a massive project and it took an army and I can't possibly mention everyone, but um, again, it was, it was an amazing project to be a part of. And finally, I'd like to thank all of you for coming today. I appreciate it. And with that, I'd like to ask if there are any questions. <laughs> Yes. Yes, certainly. Yeah, age was something that could definitely be a part of it. We um, we took ages uh, on capture, but one of the things we were concerned about um, age was actually something I didn't talk about because it didn't come out in the space use. But we did use it in the space use. We used it as more of a coarse um, young uh, younger deer and mature deer kind of categorical variable because there were so many different people um, who were involved in capture and we were trying to live age deer that we were concerned about uh, biases in age. Um, but that's definitely something that, you know, can affect temperament and has been shown to affect temperament um, uh, across individuals. Yes. Oh, oh! You mean differences between day and night and across time? We did, we did, we did check for um, a, a time trend because, for various reasons, one of which was that survival did vary across our study, uh, the time of our study. So, you know, we, we were wondering if there might be an effect of that. But yeah, we did see, um, we did see higher vigilant rates at night. Yes. How much like variation in vigilance is there? Is it like deer are either like super vigilant or not at all, or is there a lot? In no, based on I mean, based on what we pulled out, it seemed to be a fairly even spread, as you could uh, see in that um, the distribution I had of that of that index from the population. It was you know it, being thirty seven individuals, it's it's you know getting to the point where it can kind of start to show a distribution, but it seemed again to have that that kind of uh, right skew to that distribution. Well, I guess that was scaled and centered, but you know it did have a similar distribution before that. Yes, Dr. Stafford. Like when you did, uh, did capture, the second capture, uh, two questions. What, what was the overall mortality rate? And were those 37 mortalities, were those all captures or were there other sorts? No, sorry. The, um, there were 11 events in total. So after we kind of, we kind of had that intersection of um, all of the collar data and the known fate survival that we got out of that and the camera study. And pulling that together, what we were left with, with was 37 deer that had enough behavioral samples that we could um, categorize their behavior in a meaningful way. And from that, we had a total of 11 panther predation events. All It just happened that, I mean, panther mortality, I think, it's the leading source of mortality in our system. And I'm not going to get the numbers exactly right, but I think it's around 80% as far as the source of mortality or maybe a little higher, like 90% of the mortality <laughs> comes from it. Um, it's high. I mean, it's a significant amount of the mortality. But with, with just those um, 11 events, we, we were you know, kind of left with being able to test those, that, that risk index that we created, but not really much else. I mean, since it was just all females, we didn't you know, have to worry about a sex effect, which was nice. Um, but yeah, that was what was basically left when we cut all the data down. And it so happened that it was all panther predations. 
Yes, you had your hand up for a while. Yeah. Home range as it stands during the threat. Is there an interaction with population density? Because I can think of two things that could go on. If, if females are more dense, home ranges might be smaller. But if females are more dense, maybe males are more dense, and maybe there's more intra sex conflict. Mm -hmm. I'm just yeah, yeah, no, density definitely is something that affects both behavior and space use. Um, we, we have found that in our, across our study state, we had um, relatively low densities of, of deer compared to other parts of the southeast. I mean, I guess it's always a comparison. Um, but yeah, and, and that is certainly something that could affect space use. Um, I think, you know, during the rut, those males certainly, I mean, they had really low phylopatry as far as, you know, even if you broke down those home ranges. And when I created them, I actually had, you know, a lot of visual outputs from that. And it wasn't just that they, you know, again, went back consistently between successive years. It was also within years and between years, they seemed to go to different places. Um, so they really seemed to range a lot, uh, certainly. Did I answer your question? <laughs> yes, Stephen. Yeah, certainly. I mean, there, there were um, there were things that we could not get at. You know, we didn't we didn't weigh those deer. We had some indices of body condition that were taken on capture, although not necessarily always. You know, when you're when you're doing um, uh, aerial capture or you're doing you know rocket netting, sometimes you just got to let the deer go, um, uh, depending on how capture is going. And we had different individuals taking different indices of body condition that were mostly based on rump fat, where it was taken, I believe but more like visual um, or, or um, tactile. And so, you know, those weren't, and those are something I would love to, you know, have robust data on that. But it was something that, you know, we decided to introduce more noise than really anything into it. Um, but the, yeah, those are things that will affect behavior. One of the things about that, uh, that was nice about that repeatability score that you get out of a behavioral essay is it does show that, you know, basically the point of that repeatability score is if you were to, do this again, that behavior would, it was low, but it was, it was significant. So, um, you know, that this, this effect, you know, would be seen again, that that behavior is rep repeatably different between individuals. If you look across repeatability, um, just to give you some context for that number, it was 0.09. Um, uh, some, a couple large studies have shown that, you know, across a lot of taxa, granted, that the average is about 0.3. And usually people categorize it as if it's above 0.3 high, and if it's below 0.3 low. But it's also important if it's significant. And vigilance is one of those behaviors that, that um, does have plasticity to it. So you would expect a lower repeatability score. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there were several factors we included in that model to help account with that. Um, one was the trail status of the camera, so whether it was on trail or off trail, because a lot of studies in our system, or studies have shown in our system that trail status has an effect on behavior of deer in our system. And we also accounted for um, um, uh, camera as a random effect within that model, too, to try to account for that variation. Um, because of our sample size, uh, you know, we were, again, kind of limited in throwing too many fixed effects variables in there to try to account for too much. So we looked at what prior research had shown and, you know, pulled what we thought was the, the best way to minimize variability due to those fixed effects and then extract those random effects from there. Yes. Um, I, I think that's an interesting question. If we're talking about sources of mortality, um, 
sources of mortality from hunting is, is very low in our system. Um, you know, deer harvest uh, or, or deer deer um, regulations, a lot of people would consider them conservative in our system. Um, and I think that in general, I, uh, a total of three or four, one, one deer, yeah. <laughs> one deer was killed. It was, yeah, two were poached, um, but one was legally harvested um, from our system. And, you know, I, I guess that speaks to, I guess that speaks to how the deer catchability in some ways, that vigilant behavior is, is, is definitely, I feel like, going to be more directly attuned to predation by panthers. But, you know, that vigilant behavior still has effects on people and hunting as well. I mean, you know, that, that head up scanning behavior, which is what we were trying to quantify, is, you know, how you're going to try to catch a hunter as much as you're going to try to catch uh, a panther. You just might as well look a little higher if they're in a tree stand. Um, but, yeah, and I think, I think, you know, maybe that might help explain, especially in the system, if, if you think this does speak to the restoration of that mu-driven process where you are going to have these yearly fluctuations of, of these behavioral syndromes that you might go through some years where it seems more difficult to shoot a deer because you have those more uh, timid deer that are spending more time on the lookout for um, 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 panthers or hunters. But yeah. Yes, sir. So could hunters create a new driven system? And is there a potential to use that to manage deer damage issues? Potentially. I think one of the biggest limiting factors when you're trying to use hunters to create behavioral landscapes is the fact that hunters are often limited temporally, very temporally, um, in that it's a very, uh, uh, it's a, it's a very um, time, because you, can, you, know, you can't hunt at night, it's unsafe and illegal for lots of good reasons. Um, <laughs> well, certain types of hunting at night. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, certainly I, I think that that limits the ability to, and, and because of seasons, to, to change behavior in a way that might help with damage or other issues like that. Because they, deer have shown so much plasticity in that response um, that they will respond pretty immediately. And since they can eat your crops or your you know, begonias in the night as well as they can in the morning. Um, I think that's a difficult thing to simulate without a predator that is always out of the landscape. Yes. Excuse me. Um, Thank you, Heather. My question is uh, related to your Excuse bird tracker. Me. So cypress dominates our landscape and that can now as your top habitat for, very, um, for her range size. Do you think that's a function of the domination of that habitat type such that individuals are forced to be in this habitat type or near to that habitat type, or is a true biological signal that that habitat is better for deer? Yeah, and I, that, that's an important point, certainly. In a lot of places where we have deer, there is, there is a dominant amount of cypress. Um, I think that the fact that that signal did fluctuate between seasons, um, especially between the wet season and dry season, um, it, in a way makes that result meaningful because it, it helps explain um, why that was driving why that was driving space use when that forage availability was there while they could easily access it because it, you know when you're when you're as you very well know when you're walking through a few feet of water it takes a lot of energy um, to do so um, but yeah yes Lydia did you encounter any differences <coughs> Yeah, you, you mean did did phylo patchy vary between the two sites? Phylo, well, home ranges. Or, so like the overall home ranges did multiple kind of home ranges differ between these four panther like that there were maybe a bunch of females on top of each other as opposed to like Bear Island and Adlands where it was more spread and is that in any way oh. related to what is available for management these four panther as opposed to what's available for management I see. Yeah, yeah. So what you're trying to say, I, I guess what you're getting at is the fact that when you look at the spatial distribution of deer in Florida panther, they're more stacked okay. as opposed to as opposed to big cypress where they tend to be a little more spread out because of honest, honestly some of the ways you capture it in available capture sites. Um, yeah, that could certainly have an effect because if you look at if you look at where we captured in Florida panther, it's got a big cypress strand that goes right down the center um, of deep cypress water and and what we 
captured mostly on was what we called Rock Island on the western side of the site and on the eastern side of the site, um, the, the, the ridge, <laughs> which was like an inch taller, um, but the ridge land that went down the eastern side of the site. And so, yeah, you certainly also had deer that were concentrated in those. If you, if you remember that fire history map, um, you might have noticed that the fire history in Florida Panther looked really nice and clean. That's because they have uh, those small burn units created by those roads that they use. Whereas while they still have burn units and they still uh, do prescribed burn uh, in Big Cypress, they're also larger um, and more uh, more heterogeneous, I think, wildfires that happen there too as well that lead to that different looking fire history. And we certainly had deer that were stacked up where there was uh, probably a, a higher fire return interval and generally uh, a more frequently burned habitat. But I think that still gets to the question of why they had smaller home ranges there. Um, yeah, and also speaking to the fact that, you know, the heterogeneity of burns that it allows you to do with those smaller management units, because one of the important results that we saw, you know, concerning female phylopatry, if you're trying to improve deer numbers, you need to, you know, get those females good forage um, so they can uh, 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 um, reproduce. And if they're not as willing to leave their home range, it's important to make sure that you think about that when you burn the landscape. Um, you need to make sure that you, you are creating a more heterogeneous, heterogeneity in the burning of that landscape if you want to maybe have an improved effect. Thank you. Thank you. Or something. I got some pictures. Thank you. Oh, actually, they, I saw you taking them. Thank you. That would be. I don't have any photos of me ever, I know, except so I for like smelly field photos. Yeah, so, so I tried to, we'll see how good they are, but I didn't take them much. So. Thanks for all the support. Yeah, dude. You did, I loved it. No, I loved it. Halfway through, I was like, I need a Heather. <laughs> She's smiling. Hey, great job, Hunter. Did you crush it? Thanks. Hey, Kat. I'm going to get all this stuff in my pocket and go get roasted by, no, you can do great. by could, four very smart men. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I haven't worn this many layers for so long. Oh, well, toasty. Congratulations. Thank you. That was awesome. Yeah. That was really good. Are you going, uh, how are you doing? It's actually been pretty special. Yeah. Did you do anything else? Uh, yeah. yeah. You know? Either crying into a bottle or, okay. or laughing into a bottle, I guess, depending on how it works. Right? Okay. Right. Hey. Hey, Nina. I have yeah. questions for you. Yeah, give me one second. Yeah, sure. I need a. Oh. Do, do, do. I gotta turn this off. Are we on yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, I just gotta turn this off. Hey, Marcelo, do you remember how to? Get this off. Good job, buddy. Oh, yeah, I did. I, forgot <laughs> I don't show. Oh, show streaming controls. There we go. Stop recording.